lastly, uh, we're going to, uh, tonight is, is open, so to, to do, do whatever you want to, um, but uh, tomorrow we'll be having another lunch event and a raffle during that event, so um, enjoy uh, the time out tonight because we're going to have another <laughs> full day again tomorrow. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over, uh, oh, two minutes, right, okay, give me some paper. Um, I'm actually extremely excited about this panel. Um, and, and we'll hear more about why in a second. But I work, uh, my doctoral work is on digital currency, the legal design and regulation of digital currency. Uh, and, and the way I got into that actually was when I was at law school, we organized an event on money and constitutionalism as part of a series for MMA at, at law school. And uh, one of the people we were in touch with was Christine Dizan, who's a legal historian of money at Harvard. And, she was on a panel last year at the MT conference and um, described herself as a sort of fellow traveler, but a lot of her work is extremely um, relevant to and, and analogous or similar in, in content and, and theme to MMT. Um, and she had, she had a center that she's very involved with at Harvard called the Institute for Global Law and Policy, which is one of the sort of premier um, international law centers. And they had a, a series on research they were doing on sort of future of monetary technology. And I had been interested in the model in mobile money, um, particularly in developing countries, because it was an area where it seemed like various um, uh, telecommunications technologies were having a pretty uh, transformative effect on how finance worked there that wasn't really captured in traditional narratives uh, of money and banking. Uh, so I wrote a paper on mobile money development that eventually got me further involved in that space. Uh, and it, it was an interesting introduction to the world of um, particularly African monetary politics, where mobile money is, is arguably more developed there than anywhere on the, the planet. But it also introduced me to the work of um, the uh, keynote speaker we're going to have later um, and, and others. So it's, it's a pleasure to um, have, have Nadova Sula here um, and a keynote because I think we often end up uh, talking about these ideas with an implicit American backdrop in, in America. And I'm Australian. So I don't try to do that as much. But even I have an implicit, you know, English speaking backdrop. It's it's Australia, Canada, you know, UK, um, or it's, it's the other big countries, big economies, Japan, China, you know, ones that have some interesting monetary story to tell uh, that, that relates to a story back to one of those big countries. But again, often there's the narratives that, that are the most interesting or the world most um, interesting for people who are already in those spaces are the ones furthest away from those experiences. So this is, I think, one of the most uh, important stories for understanding the significance of NMT for people who are quick to say, oh, that's all just an American thing. And you hear that even amongst other white English speakers, even UK economists I've heard who say, oh, that's just an American thing, and that's why we don't have to take it seriously in, in a Corbyn administration or something, which is pretty funny for you know, people like Bill have been working on it in the Australian context for, for decades, but even more importantly than just it's relevant everywhere, it might even be particularly relevant in the non-American context. So, okay, with that, I'll uh, hand over the final to be moderator discussion for the tonight. Thanks, Clay. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Um, so just to uh, confirm what Roman was just talking about when I was trying to get my um, we're, we're so privileged here in the U.S. in this little MMT community that we're the only people who think about these questions. We're the only people who, you know, Think about MMT in the context of economics. Nobody out there in the world, especially in the developing world, is thinking about these questions. But these are some of the issues we're trying to address today. That MMT only applies in the US. But even then, it applies in the US, but you shouldn't even go there because it will cause hyperinflation. Turn it into Zimbabwe or something like that. All right. So that's why, that's why we're here today. Um, I'm stalling here to wait for, for the slides. So, my name is Paula Kabu. It's my pleasure uh, to lead the discussion here. 
with our uh, evening keynote speaker, um, uh, Ndongo Sila is uh, an economist uh, from Senegal, um, and I'll read a little bit about his work, waiting for the slides here. Um, Ndongo is a Senegalese development economist. He has previously worked as a technical advisor at the Presidency of the Republic of Senegal. He is currently a research um, and program manager at the West Africa office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Dakar. He has been four times world champion of French-speaking Scrabble. So if you're into Scrabble. Um, published uh, and co-edited a, a number of books, but I want to focus on this particular, his latest book, which is right here on display behind you, uh, in front of you. La Magazine de la France Afrique, une histoire du France CFA, which will be the subject of today's discussion. And when I first saw the book, I was very excited about it immediately, and I, the way I read it, was la invisible de la France Afrique. I said, well, that makes sense. You know, the invisible hand or the invisible army, it's more or less the same, right? Uh, and I asked him, don't go, I said, was that intentional? You're playing with words? He said, no, it was completely the, the way it came out. So um, the good news about this book, which we'll um, hear um, from Dongo today about it, is that this will be available in English next year. Uh, published by Pluto Press, with the foreword, I gather, written by Bill Mitchell. So, this is the book to put in your shopping list um, soon. So, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dongo Sila. Uh, we're going to um, listen to his presentation for um, uh, the next 45 minutes, and then we'll take a little break, like 5-10 minutes, to get a cup of coffee, and then come back for a further discussion of the issue of economic development in the context of what we learned from, from MIT. So please join me in welcoming Don Rosio. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before my talk, I would like to thank the organizers of the third MMT International Conference for inviting me. I feel privileged to attend this important gathering. <coughs> a special thank you to Juan Gay, president of the Modern Monetary Network. I am also grateful to the host of the Money on the Left podcast, Scott Bergson, William Sass, and Maximilian Seyo. They introduced me, as well as some aspect of my work to the LMT movement. I thank also Fadel Kabouk, uh, President of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity, for his friendly support. I think I have heard uh, for the first time about LMT in, um, in 2017, during a conversation with one of my colleagues uh, based in the Tunis office of the Rosa Luxembourg Foundation. I started to read the MMT literature some months later while doing uh, research on the CFA Funk uh, issue. I was impressed by the originality and the boldness of the MMT approach. I learned uh, important things I never heard of before, like sexual mass approach, functional finance, etc. <clears throat> I was happy to find a body of research say loudly that monetary sovereignty matters. Crucially, my exposure to MMT helped me understand better the CFA frank issue and influenced my thinking of how we can abolish it in a progressive way. The CFA frank was born on 1945 as a currency common to the French colonies in sub-Saharan Africa. Nowadays, the currency is still circulating it's the acronym of two different monetary blocks uh, following the same monetary management principle and having the same parity against the euro. The first uh, monetary block is the West African Monetary Union. 
and the acronym means the Fund of the African Financial Community. So it gathers eight countries in West Africa. Uh, the second monetary block using the CFA franc is the Central African Economic and Monetary Community. And they are, uh, in their case, the SEFA acronym means Front of African Financial Cooperation. So we have two SEFA fronts, one in West Africa and another in Central Africa. These 14 countries sharing the SEFA front, uh, plus the Comoros, constitute what is called the African countries of the front zone. So the Comorian front is issued by the Central Bank of the Comoros but it functions exactly like the SEFA fund, but it has a different parity against the euro. In my presentation, I will try to make three points regarding MMT and the CFA franc issue. First, the history of the CFA franc is an interesting illustration of the Chapalis approach. Indeed, it allows to rediscover familiar MMT principles, namely, Modern money is a creator of the state. Taxes create a demand for the currency issued by the state. The state that issues its own currency can buy everything that is sold in its own currency. The second point about the CFA franc and MMT is that MMT is relevant to, un to the understanding of the problem associated with the CFA franc, as the CFA franc could be conceived of as one of the most radical cases of monetary subordination. While the US dollar and the yen could be portrayed as paradigmatic sovereign currencies, the CFA frame could be described as their polar opposite, a paradigmatic non-sovereign currency arrangement. The third point is that MMT has a lot to offer regarding the discussion on how to go beyond the CFA frame in general and on monetary integration in the African continent, that, in the African continent more generally. My presentation will be articulated around six parts. The first part, intended as an illustration of the capitalist view, deals with the origins of money, modern money, in Francophone Africa. The second one describes the birth of the CFA franc as a creature of the French Ministry of Finance. The third part focuses on how the CFA franc evolved and how it works currently. The fourth part describes the advantage for friends to maintain the CFA franc as it exists. The fifth part discusses the constraints associated with such a non sovereign currency. The sixth part describes the long term economic outcomes of the countries using the CFA franc. I will conclude by assessing the different alternatives currently proposed to move beyond the monetary status quo and by stressing the general relevance of the MMT perspective for the African continent. So my first point is about the origins of modern money in West Africa. <clears throat> and I will start by a quote of, uh, from Im Iman Minsky. Every can create money, the problem is to get it accepted what anthropologists call monetary transition, and what in an MMT language we could call the transition to modern money, describes the historical process through which indigenous populations came to accept the replacement of their own currencies by colonial currencies. When France created the French West African Federation, a federation of eight African colonies in 1895, and the French Equatorial African Federation in South Africa in 1910, one of the first tasks of the colonial administrators was to try to impose the French currency. Why? Of course, money for empires was a territorial marker. However, the real reason is that they knew that as long as they did not control the money secrets, it was impossible for them to control the production and exchange secrets. To obtain control of the economic fabric, it was necessary to control the monetary surplus. Better still, by imposing its own currency, France could not only buy everything that could be sold in its own currency, but also redirect production structures. 
These considerations explain in particular why France, like the other colonial powers, had sought to unify its colonial empire in monetary terms. Indeed, currency blocks allowed monetary, banking, and financial integration between monetary policies and their colonies. They are also convenient means of reducing transaction costs within colonial empires, namely those associated with excess red variability and uncertainty. But the issue is how did the colonial administrators manage to get indigenous populations to accept the French currency? They used physical force, colonial law, and taxes. Yes, taxes. Colonial administrators started by banning indigenous currencies and the payment of colonial taxes in, in, in these indigenous currencies. Sometimes French troops were sent markets to ensure that transactions were made in franc, that is in French currency. In 1925, the colonial court, called the, in French, the court de l'indigena, introduced the obligation to use the franc in commercial transactions under penalty of punishment. Taxes, in particular direct taxes, were a means of generating a demand for the French currency, which was the subject of resistance from the populations who understood that the imposition of the farm was synonymous for them with a loss of economic initiative. As Matthew Fostater wrote in his uh, 2005 article on taxation in primitive accumulation in Africa, quote, the colonial government did not need the colonial currency held by Africans. What they needed was for the African population to need the currency, and that was the purpose of the direct tax. End of quote. Next to these particular functions, tax were also used to redirect indigenous economic structures towards the type of production desired by the metropolis. In order to be able to pay taxes in French currency, African Polish populations had to work willingly or forcibly in the sectors favored by the colonial administration, particularly those workers willing to spend. Similarly, loans from the colonial banking system were reserved for sectors specialized in products intended for export to the metropolis. In other words, the fiscal and monetary instruments were jointly mobilized to transform African societies into peripheral zones at the service of French capitalism. The result has been an economic exploration, illustrated, for example, by the importance given to cash crops over food crops. This was my first point. My second point is about the creation of the CFA franc as a, the creature of the French state. Until 1945, it was a French currency that circulated in most of the French colonial empire with differentiated monetary signs from one place to another. This situation was referred to as monetary unity. That is to say, a single currency for an empire. However, since the French economy had emerged from the Second World War very weakened, a devaluation of the franc was necessary. France's gold reserves had decreased significantly and inflation was much higher in France than in the United Kingdom, the United States, and the colonies. In this context, the main issue was the following. Should the same rate, devaluation rate, be applied in metropolitan France and in the colonies? Applying the same rate of devaluation would have had the advantage of maintaining monetary unity, a symbol dear to the metropolis but it would have inflicted the colonies and additional inflation. The French Ministry of Finance decided to apply different evaluation rates between the metropolis and the colonies. This decision gave rise to the colonial funds, including the CFA fund. The acronym CFA originally stood for French Colonies in Africa. On 26 December 1945, the French entering government declared the CFA franc to the International Monetary Fund with an incredible parity. One CFA franc was exchanged with 1.70 French franc. Three years later, following a devaluation of the French franc that had not been passed onto the colonies, 
one CFA franc was exchanged for two French, French francs. Despite the change in the unit of account of, of the franc in 1960, this parity would remain unchanged between 1948 and 1940, 1994. The issue is why had France adopted such an obviously overvalued exchange rate for its African colonies? The question can be asked, especially in the view of the fact that the currencies of the British colonies had an external value half as high as the pound sterling. To account for this anomaly, we must look at the context of the time. During the Second World War, relationships between France, then under German occupation, and the colonies had weakened. The colonies had diversified their trade relationships with other parts of the world. This has led to a rapid and significant decline in France's share of its African colonies' external trade. In such a context, the incredible parity of the CFA franc made it doubly convenient for a French economy too weak to compete internationally. On the one hand, a strong CFA franc worked to increase imports from the colonies. On the other hand, it reduced the competitiveness of the African colonies' exports, which could no longer be sold elsewhere. As a result, the colonies were forced to turn to the metropolis, which had meanwhile restored protectionist barriers around its colonial empire. With the CFA French system, France was able to have access to critical raw materials needed for its economic recovery, with the chief advantage that it could pay them in French franc and 50% um, uh, below international market prices. As we can see, uh, the CFA franc is a creature of the French state. It was born as a protectionist instrument at the service of French capitalism. This is still the case, even through the economic and financial relationships of African countries using the CFA franc have become more diversified over the decades. The third point is about how the system CFA evolved and how it works. Initially, the CFA franc was one of several currencies within the franc zone. Like the sailing area, the franc zone was born in a context of economic and monetary disintegration that led the colonial powers to integrate more with their colonies and dependencies than with each other. Created in 1939, the France Zone included French dependent territories in Africa, territories in Africa, the Americas, Asia, etc. These territories were subject to France's foreign exchange legislation as well as its trade and tariff policies. After the Second World War, the creation of colonial funds alongside the metropolitan fund did not actually put an end to the so-called monetary unity in the front zone. This observation comes from the first report on the front zone by the colonial administration. Published in 1953, this report stressed that, quote, since the currencies of the front zone are freely convertible between them, without any restrictions, at fixed rates, the front zone can be considered as having, in fact, a single currency, despite the diversity of denominations and the plurality of money issuing institutions. In other words, the CFA franc, like the Pacific franc, the Moroccan franc, the Algerian franc, were each the French franc with a different exotic design. From the late 1950s onwards, the decolonization process in Africa had led to the gradual dismantling of colonial monetary blocks. This was particularly the case for the sterling area, the Beseta zone, the Eskilo zone, and the Belgian monetary zone. For newly independent countries, national sovereignty was symbolized by issuing one's national currency and by adoption of an autonomous exchange rate policy. The countries belonging to the France zone were the only exception to this trend. Indeed, before granting them independence, France had required each of them to sign so-called cooperation agreements in various fields, foreign affairs, foreign trade, raw materials, funds management, etc. 
These agreements effectively deprived the promised independence of any substance. Thus, granting France monopoly on their mineral resources and staying in the front zone were among the conditions for the form of French sub Saharan colonies' access to international sovereignty. Throughout the 1960s, when the French farm was not yet fully convertible, the French government was even in a position to prohibit African countries from selling and buying foreign bonds and stocks, borrowing from countries outside the France zone, importing or exporting gold, and investing in countries outside the France zone. At that time, to maintain its grip on the imports of the France zone countries, France made their access to the US dollar difficult. African governments had to apply for French approval by providing an annual forecast of their imports outside the France zone. France has established import savings for certain items such as automobiles, refrigerators, air conditions, and so on. At that time, some African heads of states tried to leave the France zone, but the experiment was not successful as they faced strong resistance from France and its local allies. Guinea and the President Sebutwe withdrew, withdrew from the France zone and acquired a national currency in 1960. In retaliation, the French sector services disrupted the Guinean economy by floating it with counterfeit banknotes. The Malian president, Modibo Keita, took his country out of the France zone in 1962 before bringing it back uh, five years later. The Togolese president, Silvanus Colombio, was assassinated in 1963 by Togolese soldiers who served in the French army on the eve of the launch of the Togolese national currency. Since then, the membership of the France zone has remained stable. Madagascar and Mauritania left in the beginning of the 1970s, but Equatorial Guinea in 1985 and Guinea Bissau in 1997 joined the France zone. From the mid 1970s, the Central Bank of West African State and the Bank of Central African State had their headquarters moved in Dakar from Paris and Yaoundé, respectively. Their staff, previously 100% French, was so called Africanized. This administrative change are the basis of the conservative claim that the CFA franc is no longer a colonial currency but a so-called full African currency. As I will elaborate now, the so-called Africanization of the central banks of the France zone constitutes minor concessions that have not affected the functional logic of a monetary system which remains colonial in its foundations, its mechanism, its management, and its objectives. Indeed, the functioning of the CFA franc today as in colonial times, is structured by four main principles. First, the exchange rate of the same fine currencies is back to the French currency from before and now the euro. Second, income transfers and capital movements are free within the front zone. Third, the French treasury promises to lend euros to the central banks of the front zone if their foreign exchange reserves are exhausted. This is the so-called convertibility guarantee of the CFA franc. In other words, the Treasury, the French Treasury, promises to be a kind of pre-rate international monetary fund for these countries. In exchange for this so-called convertibility guarantee, since uh, 2005, each central bank of the France zone must deposit at least half of its foreign exchange reserves in a special account of the French Treasury. This special account is named Operations Account. Following the independences, the mandatory deposit ratio was 100%, before being reviewed at 65% between 1973 and 2005. This is the fourth principle of the France law, the standardization of foreign exchange reserves. In 2017, African foreign reserves housed at the French Treasury amounting to 10, 10 million euros, representing 15% uh, of French public deficit. The concept of operations account is an invention from French colonial administration. That's why it is unknown in economic and financial jargon. It refers to a current account 
opened by the French Treasury for each central bank of the France zone. This account tracks all financial transactions between France and the two major blocks of the France zone. For example, if France has to spend in West African France zone, France has just to credit the operations account of the relevant amount. Uh, in the same way, when West African France zone countries have to buy French goods or services, the operations account is debited by the relevant amount. Let's note that all the Euro CFR and vice versa currency conversions pass through the operations account. When this later is in credit, the French Treasury pays small interest. When it is in debit, this means that the French guarantee is active, a scenario rarely observed. Whatever the case, it must be stressed that through the operations account, France is able to monitor the external financial transactions of the CFA countries and the management of their foreign exchange rates. There is another counterpart to the French convertibility guarantee. France is represented in the organs of the central banks of the France zone. As a matter of fact, it has, France has a veto power over statutory issues and controls the implementation of monetary policy. No major decision can therefore be made without France's consent. Since the arrival of the Euro in 1999, the CFA France administrative management is also placed under the authority of the European Monetary Union. Indeed, in November 1998, France made a deal with its European partners. The CFA France will be backed to the Euro, but the European Monetary Union authorities will have their say. For example, France must give prior notice to the Economic and Financial Committee in case the CFA fund EU parity is to be modified. Likewise, a European consensus is needed in case the French convertibility guarantee is to be modified and in case the France zone is to be enlarged. In sum, we could say that the CFA fund countries are under the double tutelage of France and the European Monetary Union authorities. Following the decision to pack the CFA fine to the Euro, African countries have imported nearly all the rules of the Eurozone. The so-called macroeconomic convergence framework with its associated objectives of low inflation, low public deficit, and debts. Actually, uh, it would be more appropriate to talk about the Euro SEPA instead of the SEPA form. The SEPA form is nowadays just a disguised Euro a stock measurable of the euro. We could even talk of the CFA franc as a euro standard, the same way we used to talk about the gold standard. The fourth point is how does France benefit from the France zone? For France, there are five main advantages in maintaining the CFA franc. Those advantages were acknowledged in the 1970 Pippin report by the French Economic and Social Council. First, France can buy in its own currency and credit all goods and services sold in the countries of the France zone. This is an advantage that has been historically important. The French franc was a weak currency. It was devalued 10 times between 1945 and 1986. The US dollar is the currency in which the products exported by the countries of the France zone are denominated. If France had to pay for its imports, from the front zone in US dollars, this would have forced it to have lasting trade surpluses, an unlikely scenario, or to exchange uh, fund for US dollar on the foreign exchange markets, which would have further weakened the foreign exchange rate. But thanks to the CFA Frank, France enjoyed an exorbitant privilege in the countries of the front zone. It could pay for its import with its own currency and thus save its foreign exchange reserves. The second advantage is that French companies and products benefit from significant and solid outlets in the front zone. However, this has been less and less the case since the 2000s with the emergence of China as the leading trading partner of most French speaking countries. The third advantage is that France enjoys a trade surplus with the countries of the front zone, which also provided with significant amount of foreign exchange reserve, which have sometimes in the past been used to amortize French debt. 
fourth advantage, French companies are assured of being able to repatriate their incomes and capitals freely and with no return rate risk owing to the free transfer policy and the fact that France ultimately decides on monetary and exchange policy. The last advantage, France has a system of political control that serves its economic interests and that has the virtue of not costing it anything. France better power in the central banks of the France zone and the latest obligation deposit at least half of their foreign exchange reserves with the French Treasury are the two counterparts of this so-called convertibility guarantee. However, this guarantee has been rarely been effective. Between 1960 and today, the operation accounts were only in debit between 1980 and 1993. The average annual amounts associated with the overdraft facility of the French Treasury were really ridiculous, and above all, the facilitated capital fight at a time when the devaluation of the CFA finance were deemed inevitable. My fifth point is about the issues, economic issues with the CFA plan. And the issues can be classified into two main headings. Lack of monetary sovereignty at the political level, lack of monetary sovereignty at the economic level. Beyond the regularized adoption of the Eurozone macroeconomic management rules, the lack of political sovereignty in the front zone results from the control of monetary and exchange rate policy by French Treasury and from the still significant economic weight of French banks. By virtue of its political sovereignty over safer funds, France has a has last words in times of crisis. For example, in 1994, France imposed the devaluation of the two CFI francs, despite the opposition of most African head of states. France, in tandem with the IMF, choose to implement a uniform rate of devaluation of 50%, despite the obvious fact that this rate was by no means justified in view of the uneven degree of exchange rate of overvaluation across countries using the CFA franc. Indeed, economic coherence would have led to the breakup of the France zone, with each country issuing its own currency. But France wanted to keep intact its monetary empire. Similarly, as the sovereign over the CFA France, France has the capacity to organize a financial embargo against the head of states of the France zone with whom it is in conflict. This has been the case, for example, in 2011 during the electoral dispute opposing incumbent President Laurent Gbagbo and uh, Alassane Ouattara in Côte d'Ivoire. Alassane Ouattara was France protégé. Following France orders, French banks present in Côte d'Ivoire stopped all their operations, while the West African State Central Bank blocked the accounts of the Ivorian government. Later on, France sent its troops to dislodge uh, the President Bagbo from his palace. As for the absence of monetary sovereignty in economic terms, the absence of an autonomous monetary and exchange rate policy, it can be illustrated in many ways. First, the management of the foreign exchange reserves of the countries of the France zone depends on the ups and downs of the French currency. Until the early 1970s, African foreign exchanges were 100% held in French franc. Every time the franc was devalued, African countries lost international purchasing power with no compensation. Nowadays, foreign exchange reserves house in the operations account are subject to negative real returns. That means the nominal interest paid by the French Treasury is lower than the inflation rate in France. Interestingly, while many African countries are losing real money on their idle reserves at the French Treasury, they need money to finance development. As they cannot borrow money domestically as they wish due to statutory limitations, they are issuing euro bonds offering at least an annual yield of 5%. Secondly, the CFA fund system has the particularity of being a dual monetary union. I mean that the two monetary blocks that do the CFA fund, because of the fixed parity with the euro, form a kind of monetary union with the eurozone. 
Apart from the Eastern Caribbean Students Union, there is no known example of a monetary union with a fixed exchange rate. In other words, countries that use the CFA franc individually do not have monetary sovereignty because they belong to a monetary union. Better still, the two monetary unions themselves at the supranational level do not have monetary sovereignty since their currencies is stacked to the euro. As a result of this fact, some of the world's poorest countries, such as Niger and the Central African Republic, are dependent on the European Central Bank's monetary policy. For example, between uh, 2002 and 2008, the France CFA following the euro gradually appreciated by more than 90% against the US dollar. The price competitiveness of African countries strongly declined as a result. In the cotton sector, a product that is quoted in US dollars, companies and peasants were bankrupt during this period due only to the considerable appreciation of the euro. In Senegal, food production was jeopardized as rice producers became unable to compete domestically with the rice imported from Asia. An unfortunate consequence of the choice of the fixed exchange rate is that African countries, in terms of prices, have no adjustment mechanism other than so-called internal devaluation, austerity policies designed to reduce domestic prices and public deficits, and which ultimately lead to further impoverishment of already poor populations. Another important feature of the lack of monetary sovereignty is the dysfunctional character of the banking system in the front zone. To maintain the back uh, to the euro and to achieve a rate of inflation lower than 3%, Total foreign exchange reserves must at least equal 20% of central banks' side liabilities. Otherwise, the latter must raise their interest rates and allow the refinancing savings according to rules set by the monetary agreement signed by African countries with France. In practice, this ratio between the central banks' side liabilities between foreign exchange reserves and central bank side liabilities is often close to 100%, meaning that the two CFA francs actually operate like currency boards. This credit rationing of operating at a central bank level is reinforced by the particular high margin strategy of foreign dominated commercial banks. By high margin strategy, I mean the low volume of loans and the high interest rates applied. Despite the strong financial needs expressed by the productive sector, the banking sector often suffers from excess liquidity. As a result, the primary and secondary se sectors are marginalized in terms of access to bank loans. The same goes for small and medium-sized enterprises. For example, in the West African France zone, one third of bank loans accrue to the 50 biggest enterprises. There is, however, a more shocking figure. In 2016, the whole productive sector of Guinea Bissau, a country of 2 million people. The whole productive sector received only 39 billion CFA franc of bank loans, while the 3,500 employees of the Central Bank of West African State received 52 billion CFA franc of in house loans. It is as if we are saying that the Federal Reserve employees received more bank loans than, say, the whole productive sector in a given U.S. state. What is happening in the foreign zone is really crazy. But monetary authorities, politicians, and their experts seem to be happy with the current status quo. So the sixth point before the conclusion is about the long-term outcomes of the CFA plan. The defenders of the CFA Frank generally say that it provides economic stability through the maintenance of the fixed parity with the euro and low inflation rates. To some extent, in the developing world, the poor CFA Frank countries are the champions in terms of achieving low rates of inflation. During the last six decades, the average rate of inflation has been lower in Cote d'Ivoire than in the United States. According to the CFA Frank proponents, this deflationary environment guarantees a favorable climate for foreign investment and therefore economic growth. 
is that true? Ghana, which has a flexible currency and inflation rates of around 10%, had a stock of inward foreign debt investment in 2016 that was higher than the total of the eight countries that used the CFA fund in West Africa. The Democratic Republic of Congo, which is one of the most dollarized African countries, had received a stock of inward foreign debt investment in 2016 that was higher than five of the six countries that use the CFA fund in Central Africa. Conclusion, the case for the effectiveness of the fund zone does not hold up completely. Investor decisions are motivated by parameters other than having a fixed exchange rate or a low level of inflation. On the other hand, it can be seen that the economic growth rates of the 14 countries that currently use the CFA fund have been low over the long term. Nine of them are classified as least developed countries, while four of the other fifth non-LDCs have a real GDP per capita currently below the highest level they achieved in the 1970s and the 1980s. For example, Cote d'Ivoire, which is the largest economy in the front zone, had a GDP per capita in 2016 that was one third lower than it had been in 1978. That is nearly 40 years ago. Senegal, which is the second largest economy in the front zone in West Africa, had a GDP per capita in 2016 similar to that of 1960 when it gained independence. It should be noted that in these economically extroverted countries, the evolution of GDP gross domestic product is often different for, from that of gross national income. For example, Equatorial Guinea, a small zone farm country and oil exporter. The difference between GDP and GME has been half of GDP during the 2000 decade. The difference between GDP and GME is made up of net income transfers of both. By income, it is meant to profits, dividends, interest payments on external debt, and the remunerations of uh, expatriate workers. For Guinea Equatorial, it was the difference was 50% uh, of uh, GDP. Uh, moreover, trade within the front zone was remains weak despite more than 70 years of so called monetary integration. It stands around 5% in Central Africa and around 15% uh, in West Africa. Finally, even neoclassical empirical studies on optimal currency areas agree that the existence of the front zone is not economically justified and that its longevity is mainly due to political considerations. Uh, I will conclude by uh, discussing the alternatives proposed to the CFA finance system because uh, there has been uh, recently uh, a growing number of African intellectuals and pan Africanist social movement demanding the abolition of the CFA fund. And uh, for example, there was a November 2017 opinion polls in Togo, that showed that 66% of Togolese think that the CFA fund benefits chiefly friends and that it should be abolished. Uh, so there is some unanimity about the need to move out, the, out, out of the current monetary status quo. Some disagreements are observed about what needs to be done. Four contending perspectives could be distinguished. The first one is a perspective I call symbolic reformism which consists in touching only the visible symbols of French monetary imperialism without touching its foundations. These include proposals such as changing the name of the CFA fund, having banknotes and coins manufactured outside France, and even first reducing the deposit rate of foreign exchange reserves at the French Treasury. This perspective is articulated, for example, by the French President Emmanuel Macron. The second perspective aims to maintain the front zone by adapting it to the current context marked by the economic and geopolitical decline of France and Europe. I call it adaptative reformism. This is the case, for example, of those who want the CFA fund exchange rate to be made more flexible. Two arguments generally back this reform proposal. On the one hand, the peg to the euro is too rigid and undermines the price competitiveness of African France zone export products which are eliminated in US dollars. On the other hand, the geography of their trade flows is increasingly moving from Europe toward countries trading in US dollars, such as China. 
This perspective is articulated by South African experts. It could also be found on a 2018 highly Eurocentric report from the minister the former IMF managing director. Unlike these reformist proposals, there are two other perspectives articulating an abolitionist agenda in so far as they advocate a project of monetary integration requiring the abolition of the France zone. For example, the head of state of the Economic Committee of West African States committed in 2000 to accelerate regional integration through the launching of a regional single currency. This project, often presented as an alternative to the safe bank, raised, however, both technical and political issues. Technically, no country fulfills yet the so-called convergence criteria copied from the Maastricht Treaty and defined as a prerequisite for entry into the new monetary zone. Politically, since 2017, Mohamed Buhari, the current Nigerian president, has been asking as a prerequisite that the eight West African countries using the CFA fund provide a diverse plan from the French Treasury. But the latter have remained silent about his demand for fear of angering France. Whatever the case, I think that this single currency project is not a good idea for now. Beyond the fact that it is a gross replica of the Eurozone, there are three issues to consider. First, the benefits of sharing a single currency are not obvious because trade among West African countries is very low, around 10%. Second, there are large asymmetries between Nigeria and oil exporting country, representing half of the population of West Africa and two thirds of its GDP. And the remaining countries, which are net oil importers for most of them. Third, there is no planned mechanism of federal federalism. Instead, the members of the ecozone are supposed to adhere to the sound finance view with priority on low inflation rate and low public deficits and debts. West African countries are for now far away from the minimum threshold of political unity needed to embark in a single currency project. Those who want to substitute the CFA fund with a West African single currency adhere to the perspective I call neoliberal abolitionism. Uh, that means an exit from the CFA fund that follows a neoliberal monetary integration model as typified by the Eurozone. Finally, there is an extremely minority perspective which I advocate and like to call sovereign abolitionism, meaning an exit from the CFA fund that breaks with the colonial and neoliberal models of monetary integration, while strengthening the sovereignty of African countries individually and collectively. From my point of view, Derived from MMT principles, each CFR foreign country must have its own national currency issued by its national central bank and with exchange rates based on economic fundamentals because the CFR bank is a highly overvalued currency. However, unlike the current lack of solidarity between African currencies, we could work towards what Michael from Pani Pijo and I call a system of solidarity national currency. This solidarity could be implemented in a number of ways. The sharing of a Pan-African payments and clearing system. The pooling of part of African central banks for exchange reserves, so as to reduce the volatility of exchange rates and to lessen the dependence of African countries on the IMF loans. The implementation of common environmental friendly policies to ensure energy and food self-sufficiency to sectors very costly in terms of import bill for most West African countries. I have to admit that the idea of breaking up this front zone for national currencies is not an obvious one. Uh, before reading the MMT literature, I had myself some doubts uh, regarding the desirability of national currencies. But this is no longer the case. Indeed, the advantage of the option of solidarity national currencies is that it makes it possible to reconcile macroeconomic flexibility at the national level with solidarity between African countries. It takes into account the difference in the levels of development and economic specialization, that is the need for relatively autonomous national policies and uh, which realistically must proceed at different rhythms while responding to the imperative need for regional and continental monetary cooperation. 
However, this option of national solidarity national currencies is the object of resistance from the CFA fund advocates as well as from African regional community institutions and many Pan-Africanists for whom economic integration necessarily means the unconditional sharing of a single currency. Uh, to conclude, uh, I will say that Africa needs the MMT perspective, perhaps more than any other region of this world, for at least two major reasons. First, in the same way MMT highlights the importance, the important currency space a sovereign money issuer has, MMT helps understand the constraint of a non-sovereign currency. As such, MMT provides valuable guidance on how undeveloped countries can achieve monetary sovereignty, more financial independence. My conviction is that the current discussion on monetary integration in Africa would benefit a lot from MMT. An MMT perspective allows to go beyond the colonial safer fund and the so-called uh, national currencies and the, the tutelage of the international monetary fund without succumbing to eurozone type of monetary integration. The second reason is that resource mobilization, domestic resource mobilization, is one of the biggest challenges in Africa. And MMT is probably the most interesting and innovative research program on this topic. MMT teaches that the sovereign currency does not face any interesting financial limit, but rather real constraints. The African con continent is not constrained regarding what could be called first order resources, meaning land, labor, natural resources, in contrast with second order resources, meaning advanced technological products and know how. So African governments really committed to the idea of mobilizing domestic resources, and in particular to curbing the worrying youth employment and underemployment would find in MMT an appropriate analytical and policy framework. So I can just hope that there will be more and more works focused on Africa using the MMT numbers. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to hold your questions. We're going to take a five-minute break, uh, go to the bathroom, stretch, you know, get a cup of coffee, there's refreshments in the back, and we'll start in five minutes exactly. Thank you. find out what his intention is for the last part. Are they going to sit next to each other? I'll, I'll find out. I got it. I'm good. I'll find out. Yeah. Could you be standing? Could you be standing at the park? I'll be standing. Yeah, no, I have to go to the 
Okay, so I'm looking for, I wanted to know, what was the problem with well, no, 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 no. I just want to make sure so I can, because I yeah. zoomed in previously yeah. because it made he sense. He said, he said, his plan is, he screwed up my for donation, but I'm not asking for them. I'm giving them away for free because I want people to be able to. Thank you. I love you.
sovereignty in 21st century Africa. Um, so it would be, a, it, it, it was really an interesting experience. When I, when we first started talking about this, I thought maybe we'll get 40, 50 papers, we'll screen them and, you know, get 30-ish presentations and we'll have some interesting, we got 110 papers. It took us weeks to go through them because they were all the covered with And we only had three days to fit 30 presentations or something. So. There's a lot of interesting ideas out there. There's a lot of interest in these ideas in the context of developing countries, not the US, not Australia. Um, so the, the movement is growing. So what I'm going to do today is um, just a few slides to uh, emphasize the last point that Logo ended his presentation with, which is mobilizing domestic resources. You know, Developing countries have certain limitations, we're not ignoring those limitations, but there are options. Um, the key thing that MIT does, generally speaking, is shining this light on the mechanics of the existing system. And once you do that, and you pay attention very carefully to how the system operates, you identify power structures. You identify pressure points that are linked to those power structures that suck money in out of the economy to the top that cause inflation, power structures that set prices. And in developing countries, those power structures are even more important in the economy than what you see in the US. Um, so this is what we're talking about, identifying those power structures and building alternative dynamics in the economy by mobilizing domestic resources. It's not gonna be easy. But it's not impossible once you show the public that a path towards a better system is within reach. That's what we're talking about. So, just to, I'm not going to go through the same slides from yesterday, but just a reminder, monetary sovereignty in the case of developing countries, we're talking about countries that can issue their own currency, unless you're the CFA you know, zone. Countries that collect taxes in their own currency, most developing countries can do this, but it's the last two, which is related to issuing debt denominated in foreign currencies and facing the exchange rate and overvaluing the exchange rate um, for reasons that I'll explain. So this creates this spectrum of monetary sovereignty. Most developing countries are much, much closer to this end of this spectrum with very limited monetary sovereignty. And the question is how do we use insights from our to each one further along that spectrum and we claim monetary sovereignty. So a little bit of um, overview of kind of the recap of economic development. Post independence, it was mostly state-led economic development, mostly nationalizing you know, some of the major resources, the power company, the, you know, the water company, nationalizing the administration. But an important thing to notice here for most developing countries, post-colonial years, Day one after independence, a new government, you know, the freedom fighters, the patriots, are taking over. They're taking over a top-down, hierarchical, administrative structure inherited from the colonial times. Not a democratic structure. The same structure that extracts wealth from the colonies is right there on day one after independence. 
The same mining companies that are digging and shipping to Europe are there on day one of your independence, and they kept cranking that machine. But now with a president and an administration of the native country. So the power structures are there, and they're deeply enforced over time. So that's point number one. And then we're important import substitution and industrialization. So the idea of industrializing. But the problem when you do this in a system where you, know, you have protectionist policies that create monopoly powers to the friends of the presidents and military regime in a, in a corrupt way, which means we give you protection, you're a monopoly, build power and influence, set prices, nobody's going to compete with you, and we'll protect you forever. And that creates a very important power structure in developing countries that also sucks power and influence to the top and creates inflationary pressures within the system. Those structures are still here. Right? So it's not about you know, a loan from the IMF that will fix this issue. Right? And then you have the next phase of export-led growth. Right? This is it. You're going to export your way out of poverty. Now you're exporting manufactured goods, but your economy is not developed enough, so you end up importing all the high-value-added content from the global north, so to speak, and then you add cheap labor, and you export low-value-added content. And the faster you do this, the deeper you get in the hole, literally, right? So, the export led growth, and I'll show you a picture later, completely exploded the trade deficit for developing countries. There was a problem. What do you mean? We're exporting a lot. Why, why is the economy getting worse? We're creating jobs, hundreds, thousands of jobs for people working in manufacturing. But then we're also raising to the bottom because every other country, developing country, is also trying to attract foreign direct investment and export led growth. So cheaper labor. Fewer regulatory you know, institutions for environment, for labor laws, race to the bottom and export faster. But the more you industrialize and export in this way, the more fossil fuels you have to import to fuel the economy, the more technology you have to import, and it's a, it's a trap in the long term. And then we got to the debt crisis of the 1980s, which I'll not uh, discuss in detail, and then the neoliberal framework kind of enforced by the late 80s, early 90s to, to this day. Right? So this is this is a picture for the data for Tunisia that I can show you dozens of other countries similarly. What happens there when the when the graph falls through a cliff? That's the export led growth period. Right? That's the trade deficit exploding because the more you export, the more you have to import high value added content and oil and so on. And the flip side of this is the external debt increase. So I'm going to go through the mechanics quickly of what, what are the consequences of these numbers on the social and political context that then is also hijacked politically to reinforce the neoliberal model. Uh, so shining a light on these mechanics allows us to know where the power pressure, where the power structures are, where the structural weaknesses are, and think about alternative solutions. So the solutions that we get is more austerity, debt restructuring, meaning more loans to pay the old loans. Uh, privatized state-owned enterprises, privatize the water and the, the entire system. Uh, labor market flexibility is a, is a favorite one in, in this model, which means you know no unions, you know, don't set wages, race to the bottom. Uh, foreign direct investment and export-led growth it just reinforces that mechanics of negative terms of trade. Financial liberalization, you know, set up a little mini Wall Street to attract foreign investment, which means attract all the speculators. Doesn't work. Tourism is a big one, right? Bring more tourism. You have beautiful, you know, towns and beaches and weather. Uh, you end up importing more food to feed the tourists, importing more fossil fuels for transportation and heating and cooling, and you end up in this path towards a completely unsustainable system. Plus, every other country also has nice beaches and. You know, hotels and everything, and it's you know, racing to the bottom. Right? Remittances, you know, the brain drain, um, and which you know slows down obviously with immigration 
uh, restrictions now from Europe and the United States and other places, but for a long time, especially in the 60s and 70s, that was proposed as a way to fuel economic development. You know, ship the unemployed to Europe, and then they'll send money back home. Right? Uh, it's a race to the bottom. It just leads to more of that external trap, external debt trap that I mentioned. And we're told there is no alternative. This is just the way to do it. It's painful, but you gotta you gotta go through it. So when you zoom in on the structural trade deficit root causes in most developing countries, you can identify three. Uh, major uh, sources. One is energy deficit, and this is also true for countries that are oil exporters. Number two is a food deficit, and number three is the low value added content that I explained in the, in the industrialization process. So energy deficit, even for countries that export crude oil, they end up importing refined oil meaning they export crude oil and they import gasoline and kerosene and petrochemicals for all kinds of things. Which means they export low value added crude oil and they import high value added petrochemicals. Um, so if we're serious about addressing the structural issues that lead to food deficit and energy deficit, we have to put a policy platform that addresses these root causes. So the, the inevitable Solution is targeting these things. So the mechanics that leads to social and political unrest is built into this. So once you have the trade deficit and it starts to put downward pressure on the currency, so it devalues the currency, the next day, those same countries, if they're trying to import food or medicine or fossil fuels or whatever from the rest of the world, it's going to be imported at a higher real cost, which means you're literally importing inflation. Which means the next day you're going to have food riots because food is more expensive. You're going to have riots because public transportation is more expensive. You're going to have riots because medicine is more expensive. So what do central banks typically do? The government either intervenes to subsidize food and energy and transportation, all these things, up to a certain point. And the IMF shows up and says you can't do that. That's not the role of the government to mess up the price mechanism. Or you're going to have literally riots on the street. So this is where central banks intervene and borrow in US dollars or euros or yen to artificially fix the exchange rate at a higher value to prevent this dynamic from happening. And when you do that, you're adding to external debt, you're putting a band-aid on the problem, and then the next year it's gonna be worse. You put another band-aid and the next year it's gonna be worse. So this is the trap. And then they use this currency crisis, social, political, and risk crisis to reinforce austerity. Say, so, well, the government needs to be more responsible and, you know, privatize the water company. Well, you privatize it, you sell for $400 million, you pay a little bit of the external debt, and then what do you do after five years? You can't sell it again. So we're running out of these options because they already privatized the water, privatized electricity, and, and tried FDI, tried all of this stuff. And now we're getting to this crisis moment. Um, so the only way out is addressing those root causes with renewable energy policy, sustainable agricultural policy, water and energy management and conservation, especially with the impact of climate change. And in terms of trade, this myth about free trade and globalization of taking, you know, the idea that competition is good, competition serves consumers, lowers prices, all of this mythology is nonsense because competition, when you think about sports, you know, boxing, you know, heavyweight champion competing with heavyweight champion, that's beautiful, watch it, it's fun, and whatever. But here we're talking about a heavyweight champion playing against a lightweight champion. It's illegal, it's ugly, nobody, nobody would enjoy it, and we build all that competition. But when it comes to trade, we allow that and we say it's fair, it's competition, it's good for you, right? So we're talking about South South trade, we're talking about complementary partnerships, so competing in a trade zone where you're using resources and competing with other companies and other nations in a way that gives you true competition and allows for the benefits of competition, but also allows you to use diverse sets of resources to complement those economies and have a larger set of uh, consumer base. Um, Value-added driven industrial policy is the only way out. 
out of this industrial policy trap that we currently have. And you can't get there unless you invest in education, vocational training, and public infrastructure, and research and development. That's the long-term type of investment that developing countries were never allowed to do. In many cases, forcibly through the colonial period, industries were actually removed and destroyed because that wasn't the point. The point of colonialism was to have you know the, the colonizers be the industrialized nation and buy cheap resources from, from the colonies, as, as Ndongo was, was explaining earlier. So my idea here is to use the job guarantee as a policy platform to move along those lines, to target those areas, and have a long-term vision for reclaiming monetary sovereignty. So a quick focus here on inflation. So focus on specific inflation pressure points in food, in uh, energy, in the low value added content of industrialization, and it varies from country to country, housing, healthcare, banking and finance, which is where the power structures are often located. So again, the MMT lands not you know, taxing because we need their money, but taxing and regulating to weaken those pressure points and to break um, the these, the infrastructure that actually sets prices and causes uh, inflation. Uh, powerful price setters in developing countries, this is usually related to the export and import industry, uh, and it's usually related to the food system in particular, and healthcare system in particular. Because in most developing countries, the central bank gives a license to uh, importers, and in the corrupt system, the licenses are given to powerful individuals and business groups and they're essentially allowed to be monopolists, and they're allowed to set prices. Um, in the healthcare system, uh, hospital directors or individuals in the Ministry of Health who are you know, tasked with purchasing equipment for hospitals, they get a 10% commission, or they set up a consulting company that does the export and that, that does the import of medicine or the import. So these are the corrupt local political structures that are actually causing some of the inflation and causing some of the efficiencies. You're not gonna get rid of them by getting a loan from the IMF to buy, to buy more or to fix the exchange rate. These are things that need to be addressed. Uh, Cross-border trafficking, especially in fuel, um, in gasoline, and in many cases in food. Um, Cross-border trafficking is a serious business. Um, when we talk about the uh, underground economy, we talk about um, uh, the informal economy, this is extremely important and this is extremely dangerous because we're talking about trafficking not just in food but also trafficking in arms. In the case of North Africa, the trafficking is also human trafficking, it's also trafficking connected to terrorism. So these are very powerful and dangerous networks. In many cases connected to governments, connected to military, connected to police. These are the power structures that need to be undone. Uh, and finally, capital controls. Bill Mitchell mentioned the case of uh, Iceland. This is a deeply political, democratic process that if you have a corrupt political system, that's not going to happen. But if you have you know, the, the MMT you know, shining the light on the structures of the system and mobilizing people to say, well, this is the democratic process. We can do this to protect the domestic economy. That's what we're talking about. So finally, uh, just sort of giving us some inspiration about what is, what is the possibility. Because I, I truly believe that a better future is within reach, even in developing countries that have external debt and have all of these things. The solution, the practical solutions are cheap, are available, we have the resources. So on the sustainable flow front, I'll talk about food, a little bit about housing and cultural heritage preservation as an important platform also to use in the job guarantee system. So sustainable food, a lot of people say there's no water. There's, what are you talking about? What kind of food can you grow in Namibia when you have a drought for the last 10 years? Um, native people all over the world for the last, for a thousand years, were able to grow food with 90% or 95% less water than what we use today. Organic food, no pesticides, no chemicals. So these are you know, Native Americans growing what they, what they call growing garden, floating gardens or whatever. So, in today's world, so I want to make sure that 
you're not hearing me say we need to go back to the caves and, and, and not have any modern day technology or anything. What I'm talking about is taking indigenous knowledge that we have today and building from there. Right? So there's lots of, you know, this is not something that the hippies invented, invented in the 70s, this is a thousand years ago. So aquaponics, I'll explain it very quickly. With aquaponics technology, again, you're saving 90 or 95 percent of water use. You're producing healthy, um, uh, organic food. You have fish in the fish tank, produces waste. A small pump pumps the water to a grow bed where you're growing leafy greens, lettuce, tomatoes, strawberries, whatever you want. And the advantage here is that you're not using any soil because the water from the fish produces the fertilizers, the nutrients that the plants consume. The plants filter the water and return clean water to the fish tank, and that's how you're saving water. And it's low energy intensity, it can be on a small scale, it can be on a large industrial scale. The possibilities are there. The additional advantage of this, especially for countries that have serious water scarcity, you're not using any soil. The plants there are growing in clay pebbles to keep the bacteria to help with filtration. So now you can reallocate resources in agriculture where you preserve your most precious fertile land, your most precious water resources to grow things that can't grow in an aquaponic system. And everything else, all the leafy greens, all the tomatoes, all the strawberries, we grow them in this kind of system without having to use any fertile land or any precious water, additional precious water. So the technology is there. It's, we can apply it tomorrow, right? So this is what I did, so I wanted to try it. I've never had any background in agriculture or anything, so those are my baby tilapias. And that's, the worms are also helpful in breaking down the waste, and you can grow any kind of leafy greens, lettuce, mint, parsley, whatever. And then within weeks it's going through the roof. And, and again, I have really no expertise, just YouTube videos are trying to follow you know, where this goes. Uh, and that's the edible protein, right? After a, a couple of months. So we're talking about the most disadvantaged areas in the world. We're not going to tell people, oh, we have a job guarantee program, we need to move to the city. That's where the jobs are. Right? So this is what we're talking about, taking people as they are, where they are, and using the knowledge that we have to build communities from, from within. Um, housing, sustainable housing. Adobe housing is, you know, again, thousands of years old with ventilation that is geothermal. You know, we hear a lot of uh, engineers talking about geothermal technology today as if it's new. Geothermal ventilation means you have reasonable cool temperature in the summer and warm temperature in the home in the winter months without any use of fossil fuels or anything. So take the basic knowledge and upgrade it to modern day energies. This is a group of uh, Tunisian uh, community organization that's trying to relearn how to build this stuff from scratch. And they're doing it, right? And again, we're not going back to the caves with you know sustainable sanitation system and water and solar energy to have all the cool toys that you want to have inside the home. We just need to get people back into focusing on mobilizing domestic resources. And this is not the uh, Star Wars, this is not Planet Halloween. This is the city of Halloween in Indonesia. So thousands of years old with techniques that we were made to forget. And that's really the point here. Imagine building communities with sustainable food, sustainable housing. You can you know, bring ecotourism by revitalizing cultural heritage and you get the kind of tourism, the kind of tourists who are willing to pay a premium to get the kind of experience that you can build with this as opposed to you know, racing to the bottom with you know, cheap hotels and all that stuff. So just a few things just to start the conversation. Um, thank you, and we'll start with questions for Ndomo, um, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you. Yeah. 
Is someone who hasn't said anything yet, that would be great. Is not working? We have a mic here, you can stop it. Anyone else? Go ahead, I'm Christian. Okay. And, um, great speech, I enjoyed it a lot. And we appreciate that you uh, uh, explained this to us because I think it's a very important story. I was wondering who is opposing the development of monetary sovereignty as the elite, and is it because they're a vested interest? I'm assuming I would like to understand what sort of vested interest they have in sustaining the CFA prime system. Africa, and if there is, is that from what I hear from what you said, as I mentioned, I think, I'm sorry, uh, I, I was in the best of I think you mentioned that in Togo there was like 70% population was already uh, arguing for or supporting uh, monetary sovereignty, so clearly it's the elites of Togo who are opposing this, right? I would, I would imagine, and I don't know if you could. And expand a bit of that. Uh, Thank you for your great question. Uh, in fact, uh, um, the, the CAA Frank is a currency, but it raises political issues. And uh, what is strange in, um, in Francophone Africa is that we can say sometimes we have democratic countries. For example, my country, say, uh, is uh, held as one of the most democratic countries in Africa because there are pacific political relations, things like that, uh, no violence, uh, freedom, etc. But we could not have leaders which are not, let's like, say, in good terms with France. So, uh, when the people are in power, they know they are just there for two terms maximum. And so they have no interest in angry France. So they would not like to talk about the CFA Frank. It has been a taboo issue for decades. But uh, let's say since uh, 2016, we have to start to mobilize to say we have to get rid of this currency. I think the majority of uh, African people would like to get rid of this currency. But uh, the racist interests are so strong. The politicians are not interested, whether they are in power or in the opposition. The economists we have in the universities are much more fundamentalist than the neoclassical economists we have here. So they are not never talking about um, the CAA fine. The CAA fine is not an issue that has been uh, uh, um, publicized, let's say, by the by the academia. It's let's say people outside academia who have started to raise the issue about the CAA fine. So it's really uh, difficult for politicians to yeah to imagine how to go beyond the CAA. And uh, those are the central banks. They always have the same resources. Uh, you read the same paper, you have economic stability, low inflation, fixed rates to the new. And uh, whenever there are critics like me saying that we have to get rid of that, they will say, you understand nothing about money. Money is a serious uh, subject, so never talk about money. <laughs> so you may have a PhD, but I am an illiterate in economics because I'm emphasizing the associated right? thing. But I'm hopeful that things will change. Any other questions? Uh, hi, thank you. I'm Jeff. Uh, first, I want to thank you very much for you being here because I'm actually going to have a story that my wife will pay attention to, being the three-year-old uh, Scrabble champion, <laughs> instead of her eyes blazing over 
Oh, or, my apologies, I'm just going to be even more excited. Uh, you said that uh, the trade between uh, Francophone nations in, in Africa was only about 10%. Um, I'm surprised and I'm not surprised. Is that because of colonialism, the purpose of trade within Africa is to extract and send to the colonial nation? And if that is the case, if you were able to break that tie, uh, would you be able to? I'm sure there'd be interest among uh, Francophone nations in, in Africa trading amongst one another. Uh, am I on the right track there, or, or is it something else that keeps them from trading with each other? In fact, uh, uh, African uh, do not trade between themselves, like, for example, in Europe or in other parts, like uh, Asia. Uh, because uh, they are all commodity producers, so there is no interest in exchanging commodities. For example, in West Africa, you might have, uh, let's say, five or six countries exporting cotton, raw cotton. So it's not interesting for them to exchange the raw cotton. And this is a pattern which has been uh, <coughs> created through colonialism, meaning that African countries are much more integrated with the former metal policies than within themselves. And I think if they want to trade more between themselves, it's not through so, so-called so uh, free trade, no. It is through domestic resource mobilization. That means they have to create more production and production that will be diversified so that they will be able to extend to themselves. Uh, uh, economic integration could be interesting, but if it is uh, based on the prerequisite of, let's say, political integration, but uh, as it stands, the dynamics we have in terms of African continental free trade area, for me, it, it won't work. It won't work. Because you have to start from the national basis to develop production, to diversify it, so that people will be able to, to exchange. And to do that, you have to have all the appropriate policy instruments. Uh, uh, currently, what we are witnessing is uh, somehow a denationalization of the instruments of economic policy. That means you have no national currency. You have no tools for, let's say, industrial and trade policy. And you are signing bilateral investment treaties. So you are committing yourself to many, 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 many domains. And after that, you have no tool whatever to develop your economy. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask a question then, Nathan, uh, and then Richard, and then others. Uh, the question I had uh, was, uh, how has this been received in, in Africa and in the French-speaking world? And who do you think would you like it to be sort of received more or help mobilize more? What's the what's the sort of best case scenario in terms of where we, where we're at and where you'd like us to go through the work that you put out? Because it's obviously we're very much appreciative, but I'm very curious how you're feeling from your vantage point about these arguments now that you've released them. How has your book and your argument been received in, in the West African Monetary Union? Do you see it as something that people might pick up and use to fight? Or do you see it changing any of the conversation? Is it just being ignored? How would you like it to go further? I think that uh, through the work uh, we did, uh, and as, as a people as well, uh, the ordinary people have started to understand Let's say all the ins and outs are the CFA front. They know that. Uh, I could say that we have won the intellectual battle. We know it is an illegitimate currency and it is harmful for economic development. But at the same time, there is so much propaganda from, let's say, the uh, guys from the Central Bank, the economics, the economists at the university. They will say that if you win the CFA front, <laughs> it will be zero uh, They will say we have hyper inflation. And if you take the story of Africa, there are just five countries who uh, have uh, no episodes of inflation. But this is the, let's say, a red herring. Every time they say, you uh, leave the CFA frame, it will be difficult. And uh, for now, <coughs> and the majority of, let's say, the Africans know that we have to get rid of that. And our work has been, let's say, important to that end. Now the battle we have is political. How do we mobilize citizens, let's say, social forces to get rid of that currency? 
And I will say that uh, it supposes that just one country, for example, Senegal or Cote d'Ivoire, decided to break from the CFA defined zone, and this will collapse because this uh, whole uh, setting is based on, um, let's say, on the fraud. Because they are pulling the exchange reserves, and they know that whenever they are pulling the exchange reserves, the uh, monetary zone could be sustainable. But if the major provider of foreign reserves decided to um, break up from this zone, the zone will collapse because it could not uh, function um, on another basis. So we need a uh, progressive leader <laughs> to say that I want to have monetary sovereignty. But you could not have that through elections, maybe through, let's say, insurrectional uh, periods, producing the elections, and there may be. First, I just want to say, um, I uh, thank you so much for your presentation and uh, to kind of give a personal spin for myself and the CFA Frank that as someone who's been obsessed with money and monetary sovereignty and um, all these kind of technical topics ever since I found out about anything uh, after the great financial crisis. It's remarkable how obscure a topic the CFA Frank is, even as it's such a huge global political issue. I only found out about the CFA Frank four years ago, and I wasn't for lack of interest in monetary unions. Um, so I thank you so much for uh, this, and hope that MMT is able to center conversations about the CFA Frank more and more as time goes on. Um, and to get to my more technical question, um, to kind of connect it a little bit to my presentation yesterday, I know or at least uh, under this uh, strong uh, impression that the CFA Frank still has direct uh, credit regulation, um, especially quantitative credit regulation, and that it's a big part of um, quote unquote starving uh, other sort of alternative production, alternative to multinational production in the uh, in the CFA Frank zone. And so I was wondering if you would to talk a little bit about that and uh, how those how those controls could potentially be changed um, while still facilitating um, public spending for the public projects within the constraints of uh, the CFA Frank or a post CFA Frank monetary uh, union system. Yeah, um, in the CFA Frank, there's a credit questioning operating at a central bank level. Because as we are in a monetary union, which is not sovereign monetary union, because the objective is to maintain the parity, the fixed parity at all costs. Because it functions like a colonial zone. Uh, in, the, in their mindset, there are, there are investors there who want to repatriate their capitals and incomes. And we have to ensure that there is sufficient foreign reserves so that they will be able to repatriate their capitals and incomes with no exchange rate risk. This has always been, uh, let's say, the uh, main objective of the CFA Frank zone. And to achieve that, they are obliged to, to bust up, let's say, uh, the credit at central bank level, but also at bank level. Why? Because when you uh, facilitate credit, uh, uh, some parts of these credits will feed imports, and uh, more imports will mean uh, less foreign exchange reserves, and that will mean uh, more pressure defend exchange rate. So if you want to, uh, uh, let's say, have uh, more, um, uh, less orthodox monetary policy, we have to make this currency flexible. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, it will not be possible to have a monetary policy which will help, let's say, the financing of the local uh, economies. It will not be possible. So we have to free at least the exchange way. Uh, but my preferred option to uh, exit the CFA frame is that uh, every uh, African country belonging to the CFA frame issue uh, its own currency, which is on uh, national central bank. And uh, having a national currency uh, does not mean that there are not possibilities to, to cooperate monetarily. 
because I think having a single currency is not an alternative, but as a single currency is not an alternative to the state refund. But having, let's say, national currencies which could be organized in a way that they uh, operate uh, in solidarity. I have a question would apply to any country in the CFA Union and perhaps also to the European Union. Does it make sense under the current under the current currency regime to try to push for a guaranteed job program? And do you think it could be implemented and it would be politically strategic to attempt to do so while this while currency sovereignty is has not been achieved? Yeah, uh, I think they could try, but they won't be necessarily limited. Uh, because uh, uh, the banking sector is not responsible, is not responsive to the needs of the of the economy. So the issue is why would you uh, find those resources to implement the job guarantee? Because we are in a currency system which is not sovereign. And the answer will be the states will borrow money in US dollars, in Euro, etc. But uh, if they will do that, this will feed imports and this will put uh, pressure on the exchange rate. That means if you want to have, let's say, a coherent economic policy, a current job guarantee, we will have to free the exchange rate. Otherwise, uh, I don't think it could be, uh, let's say, uh, an um, interesting and successful policy on a long-term basis. The fixed exchange rate is real concern. Hello, hi. Um, I want to thank you so much for your presentation. It's uh, really excellent, and as someone who is uh, an immigrant here to the United States, you know, the global perspective is particularly important to me as a Latin American myself. Um, in progressive and left conversations, oftentimes we hear about the need for the global north to uh, issue reparations for the theft of wealth across the global south. Uh, but obviously when we're within, thinking within the framework of monetary sovereignty, you know, and MMT insights, I think this takes a particular kind of uh, shape and dimension that we want to think about this. So, you know, my question is, what are your thoughts about the possibility of reparations? How do we go about doing this? Or do we just get out of the way and allow things to happen uh, at, at the level of uh, the global south itself? Thank you. Uh, this is a fantastic question. <laughs> I have never thought about it, but I will say that uh, then, then we don't find the social movement asking for reparations regarding the state plan, etc. Uh, but I think even if uh, there was such a possibility, I think those reparations would not uh, help African economies because as long as we maintain such kind of economic, monetary, financial structures, it will be impossible to have, let's say, coherent and um, de development policies uh, in Africa. So I think it's important to change these structures. And the monetary uh, sector is really the one of the first to be, uh, let's say, to be reformed, uh, so that uh, this will release, let's say, uh, more uh, policy space for the governments in West Africa. But I have to say that there is some irony in the history of the CFA fund because uh, the current central bank we have in West Africa uh, had an ancestor called the Bank of Senegal. The Bank of Senegal was created in 1853 by Napoleon III. And what is interesting is that that bank, the Bank of Senegal, was created from the compensation given to slave owners by the French government. And uh, it is ironic that uh, the current central bank we have yeah, has its ancestor in the Bank of Senegal, was, which was created by slave owners. Well, thanks very much for being here. I enjoyed it. I'm very much looking forward to uh, our partnership.
Um, one of the things I think when I studied the um, CFA is to look at what happened to some of the countries that met early, like that Gaspar and Mauritania. And they have been done very well. And they have a particular Madagascar has just become drawn in a, you know, the vice track of the IMF. And then I was thinking that uh, the, the British left its colonies in much better shape than the, the French. And one of the things that uh, the British did uh, as part of the colonial experience was build up institutions that put rules of law and governmental institutions and administrative institutions that ultimately could survive and manage effectively uh, a sovereign currency. Whereas it was my understanding why the French have treated their colonies in Africa is that they haven't done that. And that, and that, that seems to be, from when I've been looking at Madagascar, that seems to be the problem, had been the problem there. They, they got their own currency but they were, didn't have the institutional structure to manage it, so the corruption and all of the sort of breaches of rule of law, and then the IMF gets in the thing and then their history. Any comments? Yeah. I, I, I agree with that, uh, that view. In fact, um, yeah, <laughs> the France zone was really an extractive zone, and uh, in the British colonies, they had, let's say, some institutions which allowed them to be, let's say, more independent. For example, in Nigeria and Ghana and West Africa are really more financially independent in some way compared to their counterparts in the West Africa. But generally, <laughs> we, we, are, we talk about so-called national currencies in the case of Madagascar and Mauritania. Uh, they don't have national, they have issued their own currency, but it's not really de facto national currencies. Because when we were under the tutelage of the IMF, we could not say that we have a national currency. And uh, in the case of those countries, they don't have any sovereignty on their resources. And when you have your own national currency, and you have no real sovereign, sovereignty on your resources, this will be reflected on your currency system. And I think this is the case for most African countries. They could issue their own currencies, but they have no resources, no, no sovereignty on the currency, because they have signed too many agreements, free trade agreements, uh, bilateral investment treaty agreements, uh, many, 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 many different things. And uh, yeah, they stay still uh, in this pattern of uh, commodity export, and with that, we could not uh, develop a strong uh, economy. But overall, uh, the former British colonies are in relatively better shape than uh, their counterparts in uh, West Africa, who can't even imagine issuing the national currency. Uh, Rowan, there's a question here. Last, last question. Uh, there's, there's a question from a while ago. Can you raise your hand so we can see you? So that everyone can see you, yeah. Well, first of all, I would like to recommend your book because, uh, as I told you before, I enjoy it. I have a question about uh, what is happening now in Africa. Is the role of China we spoke before? What do you think will be the role of the Pan de France? Can you speak about the strategy of Chinese that are doing opposing currency swaps? Do you think it's part of the negotiation between France or European Union and China? All the Bank of France uh, uh, want to have a, a role strong. Because I think it's, a, it's an interesting moment. I think China is uh, more or less uh, disrupting things in the front zone. Because now China has become the first trade partner and the first bilateral lender of many African countries. And you see, uh, in this crazy front zone, uh, the governments could not borrow, let's say, money in CFA frank because they are restricted by central banks that use and everything. So they are obliged to borrow uh, abroad. 
And uh, in the same factor, they are sticking to the Eurozone, so they want to have a uh, macroeconomic economic supply and things like that. And often what countries uh, uh, do, uh, they need money, so they go to China. And normally, every time they have, let's say, uh, uh, foreign exchange leaders, they should take half of it uh, and deposit it at the French Treasury. But there are many countries in China who now uh, bypass those rules because they it could no longer work. So I think with China, they are investing things showing that this system could not uh, ever like like it is. Another interesting thing about China is that uh, China is now the first major trade partner of African countries and of the continent. And the trade between China and Africa is in US dollars. And uh, normally, Africa does not trade a lot with uh, North America. Uh, the, let's say, trade payments is just 10% of the total payments. Uh, Payments in North Africa is just total 10 percent of the total payments abroad from Africa, but the payments in U.S. dollars represent 45 percent of the total payments. Why? Because the trade between Africa and uh, Asia uh, passes through the U.S. dollar, and what China is trying to say is trying to trade with Africa without using U.S. dollar, and there is a tendency to create, uh, let's say, uh, uh, agreements with African Central Bank so that they can swap currencies. And this is the last tendency that China has found in order to trade with Africa, but without using uh, US dollar. What is ironic uh, is that uh, Africans want to launch a uh, winter country trade area, and they don't have such kind of facilities which <laughs> itself. It's totally crazy. Hello. Uh, with that, we are ending the second day of the third annual IMT conference. Thank you all very much. I hope you found it as amazing as I did. Um, while you're getting up, please help clear our trash off the tables. Um, so thank you very much for that. And that we we have to head out immediately. And uh, people, there will be a lot of people going to hang out at the bar again tonight. Um, on a more on a lighter note. Uh, a sillier note, if you are free tonight and, have played magic, and know how to play Magic the Gathering, come talk to me.